Good day ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this video. We're going to be looking today at the design of a steel equal leg angle, which is a singly symmetric section. It will find its class 4, which means it experiences local buckling and we're going to design it in compression to SANS 10162 part 1, the South African code of practice. So here is the sort of angle we're going to be looking at. It's an equal leg angle. It's a 90 by 90 by 6 section, so 90 wide and 6 mils thick. And we're going to check the capacity of the section. Um, so make sure you have a copy of the set of notes that um, are in front of you. Um, PDFs will be available. So the question is, determine the compressive capacity of a 1996 angle with an effective length of 0.75 meters about each axis. Check your answer against the South African Institute of Steel Construction Red Book. The steel grade is S355JR. And then here are the properties from the Red Book, the um, size Red Book. And here's the design parameters. Just as a matter of interest, I'm going to use an uh, yield strength of 350 MPA. This is simply because the uh, red book is based upon a 350 MPA uh, strength, just so we come to the same answers. And here is our local axis um, system. We're going to have a look soon how we're going to rotate to this shortly. So looking at a section like this, I'm just going to quickly flick to the red book. Um, here it is. So here's the factored axial compressive resistance of single equal leg angles, and here is a 1096, and it's 196 kilonewtons. So that's the answer we're looking at. I'm just going to zoom in in case you can't see, and there is a result. It's 196 kilonewtons. The star you see there tells us it's a class 4 section, which means this section is slender enough that it experiences local buckling, i.e. the full section may not be, um, be fully effective because of its slenderness. So we're going to run through the question now and the calculations, looking at how to go about the calculations of this section. So just running through, as I said, make sure you've got a copy of these. Since equal leg angles are singly symmetric, we rotate the axis system, and this is straight out of the design code, with the y-axis taken as the axis of symmetry. However, to avoid confusion, we're going to call the updated axis system by x-primed and y-primed, simply because to make sure we know whether we're in the original axis system, as shown here, or we're in an um, updated axis system. So what we're going to do is take our second it's x and y axis are currently as shown and we're going to rotate this so that the y axis is the axis of symmetry to be like that and then we will design it according to the updated axis system and then follow it but also when we rotate it round we have to update our units now just following on with the calculations for singly um, symmetric section, the capacity is, is governed by the less of the elastic buckling stresses, FEX and FEYZ. Those stresses represent buckling um, of a perfect elastic column. So that would be, if you were model this in Abacus or Procon or something as a perfect column, it would get to that stress and then fail. Now, looking at our system, this is what I've done in terms of rotating it. I've gone from previously having the x and y to an x primed and y primed. So now you can see our x prime is, is horizontal and our y primed is vertical there. So our y primed is our axis of symmetry. The code calculations are based upon, uh, for singly symmetric, are based upon y as axis of symmetry, so we must do this first. So now that means I've actually got to change my r y primed is actually my previous u axis and my x primed is my previous v axis so i swap those around to get it to work and then also i've got a u and v primed axis i don't actually need those specifically but i've shown them for completion first the effective length in the updated system for all axes k is one normally in a truss we use an effective length of k equals one simply because the uh, connections behave as pinned there are other guidelines available though and our l is 0.75 
five meters. We have been told that above. We could potentially have different effective lengths about the different axes. Uh, in this specific example, we're not going to, but in the following example, it will be looked at. So hence, our KLX, our effective length about X is 0.75, KLY prime 0.75, and also our torsional length, KZ. KZ is the length along the axis. So looking at this, that is the effective length into the page. And torsion is simply to prevent a twist. It twists about an axis into the page, and we're trying to prevent that. So once again, our um, we're going to use 1 times LZ, and this is just going to equal our L value um, as normal, so it's 1 times that. Generally, the torsional effective length, KZ, LZ, refers to the length about which the section can twist, i.e. distance between supports which prevent torsion. The effective length, KZ, is generally taken as 1, and then if there are some additional guidelines available, however, generally it's safe to take that as a value of 1. The first thing we need to check now, now we have our effective length, is simply our slendernesses, and that is for buckling about the different axes. Our KLX over RX is 42.8. This is less than 200, therefore OK, and KLY over R is less than 21, less than 200. So that's okay. So we've checked those, and that's according to section 10.4.2.1 of the South African Code. Now that we know that slender is okay, I'm just going to classify the section and find out, does this section experience local buckling? We already know that it will fail this check, but just to go through it, we check our B over T. B being the full width, and then T being the thickness, and we find that that comes to a value of 15. We compare this against a value of the 200 over square root of Fy. I simply have added the units, MPA to the power of 0.5. This, the calculations you're done, you see done are being made in um, SMath Studio. It's freely available online, and you need to make sure the con units are consistent. But so it's simply 200 over square root of Fy, which is 350 in our case, equals 10.69. So our slenderness fails that. That means our section here, this width of the thickness is 15, but after of, of a width to thickness about 10.7, local buckling start occurs. Hence, we need to update our effective area. We're going to lose some of this area due to that effect. Ultimately, what happens, I've got another angle here. When we design it, we end up losing a bit of angle there and there because of the local buckling effect. So hence, section is class 4, thus local buckling may reduce the capacity of the section, and its effective area may need to be reduced. So we're now going to start on the calculations for the section. Firstly, calculation of member capacity. Just to remind you of what's been said above, for a singly symmetric section, failure is governed by the less of FEX and FEY. That's directly of the code. We are now working with FEX primed. So now to update what the code said, we've just given it a primed and FEY primed. So either it's going to buckle outwards. So as it's, we're going to load and load and it'll buck forward. Or it's a YZ, which is a twisting failure. We're looking then for a lateral torsional buckle. So we need to check both of those failure modes and find which one is weaker, and that will govern our capacity. What we first need to do, though, is find out where the shear center. I'm going to calculate all the parameters needed and then plug those into the equations for FEX primed and FEY prime Z. Calculate the distance of the shear center from the neutral axis. The shear center is located at T over 2 from each corner of the angle. Ensure the values are in the rotated section. If we look at an angle, our shear center occurs at roughly t over 2 from the edge. So it's occurring about there. So we need to find out where is that distance relative from here. So that's going to be our y naught value. And to, get, to, to calculate this, we're just going to get a distance. This is our a y value, a y in the red book, minus t over 2 and then converted it into uh, at 45 degrees. So that is where this calculation here comes from. Our y naught primed, 
y naught prime does a y minus t over two, and then divided by sine of forty five. In the software, it works in radians, so I've simply converted degrees to radians there. That's why it looks different, and that is twenty nine point eight four. So this distance here, y naught, the distance from the centroid. So there's our centroid, and there is our shear center. Our shear center, and that distance is y naught primed. Let me just call it that, y naught primed. So that's the distance along the y axis from the centroid. Then the x x naught value is much simpler because this um, shear center lies on the x x axis. Our x naught value is zero, as you'll see here. So the shear center falls on the y axis. This x naught equals zero millimeters, and so we can go through the calculations as such. Now, properties for calculating elastic buckling stresses. To quantify this value, x naught, y naught, and then also the radius of gyration, we have this r naught or r naught squared values that you'll see appearing in the calculations just now. Those help us quantify how far the centroid is from the shear center, because because of that, we have more or less twist in the section. So we're trying to quantify it where shear center, where centroid, and as the load comes down the centroid, how much twist or lateral torsional um, effects does it give to our section. So there we calculate those, and then omega once again quantifies the x naught and y naught prime values over r naught. And then for an angle also, our warping constant is approximately zero. It has very low warping stiffness, so we use a value of zero there in the calculations of our sections. We can now, now that we've determined these parameters, go on to the rest of the calcs. And we can get our um, stresses. So this is lateral elastic buckling stresses. This is how much must be loaded until it's, we squash it and it buckles about the xx primed axis or about the yy prime. So it's either sort of forward upwards on the screen or to the left or right. That's x and y respectively. We calculate those 1011 MPA or 4225. As expected, the, this is our strong axis. This is our weak axis. So the weak axis bus weak axis buckling occurs much um, sooner. Then we get our torsional and flexural torsional. We first have to calculate our torsional. So this is what stress would we have to put on the section to cause it to twist. We run through this calc. This term basically disappears because CW is approximately zero. So our GJ over AR naught squared value governs, and we get a value of a buckling stress when it's loaded. These values then get um, plugged into a further equation to get our lateral torsional buckling stress, as here. Um, quite a long equation, but ultimately it gets what stress do we need to load until it twists and fails at the same time. Remember, these are theoretical stresses. Once we found those, we get the minimum you don't necessarily have to check the EY value. I've put it in completeness here simply because if you have multiple effective lengths, potentially it may govern. So I've said our elastic stress is the minimum of X, Y, and Z. As I said, the code does not say we need to check if EY primed. However, if the effective length about that axis is greater, it should be checked. Once we have an elastic buckling stress, that's our elastic buckling stress, we need our non-dimensional slenderness. So that is the value of the um, yield stress relative to our elastic stress, square rooted. So that's our lambda, 0.8985. This is an we use in an empirical equation um, to get our failure stress. Just zooming out so you can see everything, because there's quite a bit of explanations here. So our failure stress, F. That's Fy. So our yield stress times some buckling constant. This whole term is always somewhere between 0 and 100%. That's just saying of the total value of failure stress, how much can we use? We plug our value for lambda in, and we find that from an original 350, our failure stress is now actually at about 230 MPA. We need the stress to calculate its updated um, value of the effective width. Here we've calculated the stress in the member based on the maximum stress it would take based on its slenderness. So determining 
from this non-dimensional slenderness, we can calculate approximately its failure stress, and then we'll use this in the equation below. If we'd been supplied a compressive load, we could have also calculated the stress according to that, but we haven't in that case. We now need to determine if the effective area of the section must be reduced to the count for local buckling, since the section is class 4. So our current in element slenderness is 15, and this exceeds what will happen to a... well. If exceeds what we allow to do for a class 4 section. Above, we did a simple check to see if it is a class 4 section. So we know it is. Now, does it experience local buckling? If that check fails, then we determine a limiting value, a limiting slenderness, w, w lim, based on the stress in the member. That's why we just determined the stress above. As the stress in the member increases at failure, it's more likely to experience local buckling. Let's say we've got this angle here and it's 10 meters long, it has, well, let's say 2 meters, it won't quite get to 10 meters, if it's 2 meters long, it might fail at a certain stress. If it comes down to our 0.75 meter angle we're looking at, it's going to fail at a much higher stress, meaning local buckling is more likely. So we're asking the question is, based on its global failure, is local failure going to occur first, local buckling, or is global failure going to occur? Do we need to update our effective area to account for that. So which at high stress levels, at high levels of stress, i.e. short members, local buckling will probably occur, but as members become longer, local buckling may not occur anymore. Since the angle leg has support on only one side, k equals 0.43, here's our angle. It has it just sticks out from a joint, so this is a value of 0.43. If it was supported along two edges, then it would have a different K value. For instance, here is a channel. If we were checking um, local buckling, this would be K of 4, because this web is supported along both edges. So if it was to experience a local buckle, it, this flange and this flange would prevent it, whereas in this case, we've got an angle, so we're only looking at this edge here, so this is K is 0.43. Once we've got that, our maximum slenderness we can have, based on its actual stress and based on its properties, is 12.4. This means we still exceed our value. We're still greater than the actual slenderness. Hence, this ex section will experience local buckling and the affection. effective area must be reduced. Our value W here is too high. We've got to reduce our effective length and get it um, into a value that works. So we're going to do that now. We're going to see how much material have we lost. So there's an equation in the code for an effective area, B effect. I've called it, um, just added the subscript EFF to effective. In the code, it's just called B, but to avoid confusion, just to know it's different. We run through, this equation is just updating its total thickness and area, um, sorry, based on its thickness, it's updating the total width, and we get to a width of 80.6 mils. That means our original width was 90 mils, but now we've lost a bit of the edge each side, we can only use 80.6 millimeters of the section and we lose this end part. So what you'll see here is the effective areas, area minus two, one side, two sides, B minus B effective, so that's B minus B effective, that width times the thickness. And we've now reduced our total effective area to be that. Once we reduce our effective area, we have accounted for the fact that local buckling occurs. This accounts for the fact that the area is not fully effective. We've lost a little bit each side. And we're now designing it as a less efficient um, member. Our failure stress still stays the same. That was calculated above. But we just multiply that failure stress we calculate by the effective area by phi, and we get to our final resistance of 196 kilonewtons, which we know is what we actually had a look at at the beginning, was what we determined before we even started what we were looking for. So we can see the process we followed is correct, and we have a value that we've compared against. And you can see now how the main things we had to do was rotate the axis system, adjust the area, and then we could calculate our global 
um, a, a total resistance in compression of the section, which is 19, roughly 19.6 tons and seems more or less uh, effective or correct for such a size member. So thank you very much.